Section 2 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 1, Augustus, B.C. 31 to A.D. 14, Part 1. The victory of Actium had made Octavianus the undisputed master of the Roman world. One by one rivals and obstacles had been swept away, and the patient schemer had now mounted to the topmost rung of the ladder of ambition. During the troublous years of the long struggle for power, his public life had been one course of selfish aims, unscrupulous acts, and makeshift policy. He had yet to prove that there was anything of real and abiding greatness in his schemes to raise him from the ranks of mere political adventurers. But from this time we may trace a seeming change of character, which is the more remarkable because it is so hard to parallel. It was no change of measures only, such as often comes with new conditions, such as that which made the founder of the dynasty reverse much of the policy of the earlier years. For spendthrift and prodigal as Julius had been before, he used his power to curtail extravagance, sent police agents to the markets and even to the houses of the wealthy to put down luxury by force. The leader of the popular party forbade the growth of guilds and social clubs like those which had often carried the elections in his favor. The favorite of the populace was anxious to check the spread of pauperism by sterner measures. The revolutionary general, whose tent had been the refuge of the men of tarnished name and ruined fortunes, baffled all their hopes of plunder by passing stringent measures to restore credit and to curb official greed. Octavianus, also in like case, resorted to like policy. One of his first cares was to repeal the unconstitutional acts of his earlier life, and so to close the period of revolution he took steps without delay to restore order and to strengthen the moral safeguards which years of anarchy and civil war had almost ruined. To this end he passed laws like those of Julius, and unlike his kinsmen, was enabled by his long tenure of power to carry out a conservative reform in morals and religion which left some enduring traces. But the change in character lay deeper far than this. He had shown while the struggle lasted, a cruelty without excuse. Though possibly reluctant at the first to engage in proscriptions, he is said to have acted in them more relentlessly than either of his colleagues. He had his prisoners of war butchered in cold blood, mocked at their prayers for decent burial, and calmly watched their dying agonies. That he was hard and pitiless beyond the spirit of his times is implied in many stories of the day, and among others we read that when the captives of Philippi passed in bonds before their conquerors, they saluted Antonius with marked respect, but vented their deepest curses on Octavianus to his face. But after Actium, he showed what was for that age an unusual clemency. He spared his open enemies, he hunted out no victims, and professed even to burn the secret papers of his rival which might have compromised his partisans at rome the same gentler spirit breathes through the whole of his long period of rule his jealous intolerance had led him once to drive a consul elect to suicide for a bitter word and to fine or banish citizens of nursia for honouring with a monument their dead who had fallen as they wrote in defence of freedom on the field of mutina but he was ready now to show respect to the memory of Pompeius, to let historians write the praises of the great republicans of Rome, to congratulate the men of Mediolanum, Milan, for prizing the busts of Brutus, to listen calmly to the jibes vented on himself in popular satires or in dead men's wills, to let even lampoons be scattered in the Senate House and make no effort to hunt down the authors. His suspicious fears had made him once give orders for the instant execution of a curious bystander who had pressed in too eagerly to hear him speak in public, and put even to the torture a praetor who came to greet him and whose hidden notebook was mistaken for a dagger. 
but in later life he walked without an escort through the streets went to and fro to join the social gatherings of his friends and showed no fear of an assassin's knife the cheerful cordiality and homely courtesies of his maturer age were a marked contrast to the cold ungenial reserve of earlier days and those who find his real character hard to read may see perhaps a fitting symbol for it in the figure of the sphinx which he wore upon his signet ring but this change of manner could not be an easy thing and was probably not soon effected there are signs which seem to show that constant watchfulness and self-restraint was needed to curb his natural temper and that personal influences were at work to help him though he was patient and merciful in most cases that were brought before him when on the seat of judgment it is said that mycenas who was standing by marked on one occasion the old bloodthirsty instinct reappear and flung to him a hasty note with the words rise hangman written on it another time when stung by what was uttered in the senate he hurried out abruptly and excused himself afterwards for want of courtesy by saying that he feared his anger would slip from his control we are told that with others commonly and even with livia his wife he would not always trust himself to speak on subjects of grave moment without writing down the notes of what he had to say in the gloom that settled on him in old age when family losses and dishonour coupled with national disasters weighed upon his mind the hard and unlovely features of his character long hidden out of sight seemed to come to light once more as the force of self-control was weakened by the laws of natural decay yet even with such reserves his history presents a spectacle almost unexampled of the force of will in moulding and tempering an ungenial nature and of the chastening influence of sovereign rule the signal victory just won the honours voted by the servile senate the acclamations of the people the license of unbounded power might well have turned his head as they proved fatal to the temper of many a later emperor but the dagger of brutus haunted his memory and warned him to beware of outraging roman feeling but far beyond its effect upon his personal bearing we may trace the influence of these warning memories on the work which lay before him of giving shape and system to the future government of rome power and repute had passed away from the old forms of the republic the whole world lay at the feet of the master of many legions it remained only to define the constitutional forms in which the new forces were to work but to do this was no easy task the perplexities of his position the fears and hopes that crossed his mind are thrown into dramatic form by the historian dion cassius who brings a scene before our fancy in which octavianus listens to the conflicting counsels of his two great advisers agrippa and mycenas the former is supposed to paint in sombre colours the difficulties of a monarch's lot to remind him of the warnings of the past and the dangers of the future and strongly to urge him to copy the example set by sulla and after passing needful laws and strengthening the safeguards against anarchy and license to resign the outward show of power and come down from the dizzy pinnacle of greatness mycenas on the other hand counsels absolute rule though masked by constitutional disguises and describes at great length a system of centralized government in sketching which the historian drew mainly from the experience of his own later times and with slight regard for strict historic truth attributed to the inventive genius of mycenas a full-grown system of political machinery which it took some centuries of imperialism to develop but though we must regard the narrative in question more as the writer's own political theorizing than as a sketch of matter of fact yet there is little doubt that schemes of resignation were at some time discussed by the emperor and by his circle of advisers it is even possible as the same writer tells us that he laid before the senators at this time some proposal to leave the helm of state and to let them guide it as of old we are told that they were thrown into confusion by his words and that mistrusting his sincerity 
or fearing the return of anarchy and the scramble for power that would soon ensue they all implored him to withdraw his words and take back the power which he had resigned the scene if ever really acted was but an idle comedy and the offer could scarcely have been seriously meant though there may have been some passing thought of it even at this time and still more at a later period when he had long been sated with power and burdened with the cares of office it is more probable that he was content with some faint show of resistance when the senate heaped their honours on his head as afterwards when more than once after a ten years interval they solemnly renewed the tenure of his power but we cannot doubt his sincerity in one respect in his wish to avoid the kingly title and all the odious associations of the name it had been from early times offensive to roman ears it had grown far more so as they heard more of the wanton lust and cruelty and haughtiness of eastern monarchs and they scorned to be degraded themselves to the level of their cringing subjects the charge of aspiring to be king had often been an ominous cry in party struggles and had proved fatal to more than one great leader it had been truly said perhaps of caesar and had largely helped to ruin him and his successor was too wary to be dazzled by the bauble of a name he shrank also from another title truly roman in its character but odious since the days of sulla and though the populace of rome when panic-struck by pestilence and famine clamoured to have him made dictator and threatened to burn the senate as it sat in council if their will was not obeyed yet nothing would induce him to bear the hateful name but the name of caesar he had taken long ago after his illustrious uncle's death and this became the title first of the dynasty and then of the imperial office besides this he allowed himself to be styled augustus a name which roused no jealousy and outraged no roman sentiment yet vaguely implied some dignity and reverence from its long association with the objects of religion as such he preferred it to the suggested name of romulus and allowed one of the months to be so called after him as the preceding one of julius had been named after his kinsman with this exception he assumed no new symbol of monarchic power but was satisfied with the old official titles which though charged with memories of the republic yet singly corresponded to some side or fragment of absolute authority the first of these was imperator which served to connect him with the army the imperium which the name expressed had stood in earlier days for the higher functions more especially for the power of the sword which belonged to civil as well as military authority but gradually curtailed in other cases by the jealousy of the republic it had kept its full meaning only in the camp the imperator was the general in command or in a still more special case he was the victorious leader whose soldiers had saluted him upon the field of battle julius whose veterans had often greeted him with this title in many a hard-fought campaign chose it seemingly as a fitting symbol of the new regime as a frank avowal of its military basis and in this sense it was found convenient by his successors it implied absolute authority such as the general has over his soldiers and the concentration in a single chief of the widespread powers entrusted to subordinate commanders it suggested little of the old forms of constitutional election but appealed rather to the memory of the army's loyal acclamations and gave a seeming claim to their entire obedience the title of the tribunician power connected the monarch with the interests of the lower orders in the early days of privilege when rome was parted into rival classes the tribunes had been the champions of the commons sacrosanct or inviolate themselves and armed with power to shield the weak from the license of the magistrate or noble they gradually assumed the right to put a veto or check on all public business in rome in the party struggles of the last century of the republic they had abused their constitutional powers to destroy the influence of the senate and organize the popular movement against the narrow oligarchy of the ruling classes such authority was too important to be overlooked or entrusted in its fullness into other hands the emperor 
did not indeed assume the tribunate but was vested with the tribunician power which overshadowed the annual holders of the office it made his person sacred not in the city only or in discharge of official acts as in their case but in all times and through the whole breadth of the empire it gave him the formal right to call the meetings of the senate and to lay before them such business as he pleased and thus secured the initiative in all concerns of state out of the old privilege of appeal to the protection of a tribune came the right of acquittal in judicial functions which made the emperor a high court of appeal from all the lower courts and out of which seemingly has grown the right of pardon vested in the kings of modern europe the full meaning and extension of the title seems not to have been discerned at once but once grasped it was too important to be dropped by its succeeding emperors dated the tenure of their power as by the years of a king's reign and the formal act by which the title was conferred on the kinsman or the confidant who stood nearest to the throne seemed to point him out for succession to the imperial rank the familiar name of prince was one of dignity rather than of power the princep senatus in old days had been the foremost senator of his time distinguished by weight of character and the experience of high rank early consulted in debate and carrying decisive influence by his vote no one but the emperor could fill this position safely and he assumed the name henceforth to connect him with the senate as other titles seemed to bind him to the army and the people for the post of supreme pontiff augustus was content to wait a while until it passed by death from the feeble hands of lepidus he then claimed the exclusive tenure of the office and after this time pontifex maximus was always added to the long list of imperial titles it put into his hands as the highest functionary of religion the control of all the ritual of the state it was a convenient instrument for his policy of conservative reform and associated with his name some of the reverence that gathered round the domain of spiritual life besides these titles to which he assumed an exclusive right he also filled occasionally and for short periods some of the republican offices of higher rank both in the capital and in the country towns he took from time to time the consular power with its august traditions and imposing ceremonial the authority of kensor lay ready to his hands when a moral reform was to be set on foot and a return attempted to the severity of ancient manners or when the senate was to be purged of unworthy members and the order of the equites or knights to be reviewed and its dignity consulted beyond the capital the proconsular power was vested in him without local limitations and gave him the right to issue his instructions to the commanders of the legions as the great generals of the republic had done before finally he deigned often to accept offices of local dignity in the smaller towns throughout the empire appointing in each case a deputy to discharge the duties of the post the offices of state at rome meanwhile lasted on from the republic to the empire unchanged in name and with little seeming change of functions consuls praetors quaestors tribunes and aediles rose from the same classes as before and moved for the most part in the same round of work though they had lost forever their power of initiative and real control elected by the people formerly but with much sinister influence of bribery and auguries they were now mainly the nominees of caesar though the forms of popular election were still for a time observed and though augustus condescended to canvass in person for his friends and to send letters of commendation for those whom he wished to have elected the consulship was entirely reserved for his nominees but passed rapidly from hand to hand since in order to gratify a larger number it was granted at varying intervals for a few months only for though it was in fact a political nullity henceforth and its value lay mainly in the evidence of imperial favour or its prospects of provincial office yet the old dignity lasted still and for centuries the post was spoken of by romans as almost the highest prize of their ambition for lower posts a distinction was observed between the places 
generally less than half, reserved entirely for the emperor to fill with his candidati caesaris, as they are called in their inscriptions, and those that were left for some show of open voting, though influenced it might be by court favour. The peculiar feature of the old Roman executive had been its want of centralised action. Each magistrate might thwart and check his colleague. The collision between different officials, the power of veto, and the absence of supreme authority might bring the political machinery to a deadlock. The imperial system swept aside these dangers, left each magistrate to the routine of his own work, and made him feel his responsibility to the central chief. It was part of the policy of Augustus to disturb as little as possible the old names and forms of the Republic, to leave their show and dignity that those who filled them might seem to be not his own creatures, but the servants of the state. But besides these, he set up a number of new offices, often of more real power, though of lower rank. He filled the most important of them with his confidants, delegating to them the functions which most needed his control, and in which he could not brook any show of independence, and left behind him the rudiments of a centralized bureaucracy, which his successors gradually enlarged. Two terms correspond respectively to two great classes, the name Praefectus, the Prefet of modern France, stood in earlier days for the deputy of any officer of state charged especially to execute some definite work. The praefects of Caesar were his servants, named by him and responsible to him, set to discharge duties which the old constitution had commonly ignored. The prefect of the city, Praefectus Urbi, had appeared in shadowy form under the Republic to represent the consul in his absence. Augustus felt the need, when called away from Rome, to have someone there whom he could trust to watch the jealous nobles and control the fickle mob. His trustiest confidants, Mycenas and Agrippa, filled the post, and it became a standing office with a growing sphere of competence, overtopping the magistracies of earlier date. The praefects of the praetorian cohorts first appeared when the Senate formally assigned a bodyguard to Augustus later in his reign. The troops were named after the picked soldiers who were quartered round the tents of the generals of the Republic, and when they were concentrated by the city walls, their chief commanders soon filled a formidable place in history, and their loyalty or treachery often decided the fate of Rome. Next to these in power and importance came the praefects of the watch, the new police force organized by Augustus as a protection against the dangers of the night and of the corn supplies of Rome, which were always an object of especial care on the part of the imperial government. And besides these, there were many various duties entrusted by the head of the state to special delegates, both in the capital and through the provinces. The title, procurator, which has come down to us in the form of proctor, was at first mainly a term of civil law, and was used for a financial agent or attorney. The officers so-called were regarded at the first as stewards of the emperor's property or managers of his private business. They were therefore for some time of humble origin, for the emperor's household was organized like that of any Roman noble. Slaves or freedmen filled the offices of trust, wrote his letters, kept his books, managed his affairs, and did the work of the treasurers and secretaries of state of later days. Kept within bounds by sterner masters, they abused the confidence of weak emperors and outraged Roman pride by their wealth, arrogance, and ostentation. The agents of the emperor's privy purse throughout the provinces were called by the same title, but were commonly of higher rank and more repute. Such in its bare outline was the executive of the imperial government. We have next to see what was the position of the senate. That body had been in early times the council summoned to advise the king or consul. By the weight and experience of its members and their lifelong tenure of office, it soon towered above the short-lived executive and became the chief moving force at Rome. But the policy of the Gracchi had dealt a fatal blow at its supremacy. Proscriptions and civil wars had thinned its ranks. The first Caesar had treated it with studied disrespect 
and in the subsequent times of anarchy the influence of the order and the reputation of its members had sunk to the lowest depth of degradation it was one of the first cares of augustus to restore its credit at the risk of odium and personal danger he more than once revised the list and purged it of unworthy members summoning eminent provincials in their place he was careful of their outward dignity and made the capital of a million sesterces a needful condition of the rank the functions also of the senate were in theory enlarged its decrees on questions brought before it had henceforth the binding force of law as the popular assembly ceased to meet for legislation case after case was submitted to its judgment till it gained speedily by prescription a jurisdiction of wide range and before long it decided the elections at its will or registered the nominations of the emperor but the substance of power and independence had passed away from it for ever matters of great moment were debated first not in the senate house but in a sort of privy council formed by the trusted advisers of the emperor while the discussions of the larger body served chiefly to mask the forms of absolutism to feel the pulse of popular sentiment and to register decisions formed elsewhere treated with respect and courtesy by wary princes the senators were the special mark of the jealousy and greed of the worst rulers end of section two Section 3 of Roman History, The Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 1. Augustus, B.C. 31 to A.D. 14, Part 2. If we now turn our thoughts from the center to the provinces, we shall find that the imperial system brought with it more sweeping changes and more real improvement almost every country of the roman world had long been frightfully misgoverned toward the end of the republic there rises from every land a cry in tones that grow ever louder a cry of misery and despair that their governors are greedy and corrupt scandalously indifferent to injustice conniving at the extortion of the roman capitalists who farmed the tithes and taxes and of the money-lenders who had settled like leeches all around them the governors who hastened to their provinces after a short tenure of official rank at rome looked to the emoluments of office to retrieve their fortunes exhausted frequently by public shows and bribery at home they abused their power in a hundred ways to amass enormous wealth with little check from the public opinion of their order or from the courts of law before which they might possibly be prosecuted by their victims or their rivals but a new order of things was now begun augustus left to the senate the nominal control of the more peaceful provinces which needed little military force to these ex-consuls and ex-praetors were sent out as before but with no power of the sword and little of the purse high salaries were paid to them directly by the state but the sources of indirect gains were gradually cut off by their side was a proctor of the emperor's privy purse to watch their conduct and report their misdemeanors at home there was a vigilant ruler ready to give ear to the complaints of the provincials and to see that justice was promptly done by the tribunals or the senate doubtless we still hear of much misgovernment and scandalous abuses sometimes are detailed for the evils to be checked had been the growth of ages and the vigilance of a single ruler however strict must have been oftentimes at fault the remaining countries called imperial provinces were ruled by generals called legati or in some few cases by proctors only they held office during the good pleasure of their master and for longer periods often than the senatorial governors there are signs that the imperial provinces were better governed and that the transference of a country to this class from the other was looked upon as a real boon and not as an empty honour such in its chief features was the system of augustus the rudiments of the bureaucratic system which was slowly organised by later ages 
this was his constructive policy and on the value of this creative work his claims to greatness must be based to the provinces the gain undoubtedly was great his rule brought them peace and order and the essentials of good government it left the local forms of self-rule almost untouched and lightened if it did not quite remove the incubus of oppression which had so long tightened its grasp upon their throats at rome too the feeling of relief was keenly felt credit recovered with a rebound after the victory at actium prices and the rate of interest fell at once the secret adherents of the fallen cause began to breathe again more freely when they heard no mention of proscription the friends of order learnt with joy that the era of anarchy was closed rigid republicans found their jealous suspicions half disarmed by the respect shown for the ancient forms and names by the courtesy with which the senate had been treated and above all perhaps by the modest unassuming manners of their prince for he shunned carefully all outward pomp moved about the streets almost unattended sat patiently through the games and shows which the romans passionately loved went out to dinner readily when asked and charmed men by his simple courtesy he could bear plain speaking too for a blunt soldier to whose petition he said that he had been too busy to attend told him to his face that he had never said he was too busy to expose his own life for him in battle the expenses of his household scarcely rose to the level of those of many a wealthy noble he wore no clothes save those made for him by livia and her women and studiously avoided all profusion or extravagance he tried also to spare his people's purses for upon a journey he often passed through a town by night to give the citizens no chance of proving their loyalty by costly outlay but he spent his treasure lavishly for public ends the public games and festivals provided by him were on a scale of magnificence quite unexampled great sums were often spent in largesse to the populace of rome in times of scarcity corn was sold in the capital below cost price besides the vast quantities distributed in free doles among the poor noble senators of decayed fortunes were often pensioned to enable them to live up to their rank costly buildings set apart for public uses temples baths theatres and aqueducts rose rapidly on every side his kinsmen intimates all whom his influence could move vied with him in such outlay and helped him to realize the boast of later days that he found a city of brick and left one of marble in its place the great roads in italy and through the provinces were carefully repaired and a postal system set on foot confined it is true to official uses armed patrols marched along the roads brigandage was forcibly put down slave gangs were inspected and the abuses of times of violence redressed in the capital itself a police force was organized for the first time intended mainly at first for protection against fire but soon extended and made permanent to secure peace and order in the streets which for centuries the republic had neglected in distant countries his fatherly care was shown in time of need by liberal grants of money to help public works or repair the ravages of earthquakes the interests of the legions also were consulted but not at the expense of quiet citizens as before vast sums were spent in buying up lands in the neighbourhood of the great towns of italy where war or slow decay had thinned their numbers in order at once to recruit the urban population and supply the veterans with farms colonies were planted too beyond the seas for the relief of the overgrown populace of rome there was enough in such material boons to conciliate all classes through the empire the stiff-necked champions of the republic had died upon the battlefield a generation had grown up demoralized by years of anarchy and few were left to mourn the loss of freedom few eyes could see what was one day to be apparent that the disguises and the insincerities of the new regime were full of danger that to senator and office-bearer the paths of politics were strewn with snares that in the face of a timid or suspicious ruler it would be as perilous to show their fear 
as to make a brave show of independence. For a while they heard the familiar sounds of senate, consul, and of tribune. They saw the same pageants as of old in daily life. Nor did they realize as yet that liberty was gone forever, and that the ancient forms that passed before them were as empty of real life as the ancestral masks that moved along the streets to the noble Roman's funeral pyre. From the imperial machinery we may next turn to the great men who helped possibly to create, and certainly to work it. It was the singular good fortune of Augustus to secure the services of two ministers like Agrippa and Mycenas, of different genius, but equal loyalty of character. Marcus Vipsanius, surnamed Agrippa, had been in early days the schoolmate and intimate of Octavius. They were at Apollonia together, studying the philosophy and art of Greece, when the tidings came that Caesar had been murdered. They were together when the bold scheme was formed, and the two youths set forth together to claim the heritage of Caesar and to strive for the empire of the world. To whom the initiative was due we know not, but we do know that Agrippa's courage never wavered, though Octavianus seemed at times ready to falter and draw back. To the many-sided activity of Agrippa, and to his unfailing resolution, the success of that enterprise seems mainly due. He was the great general of the cause that triumphed, the hero of every forlorn hope, and the knight-errant for every hazardous adventure in distant regions. His energy helped to win Perugia after stubborn siege. His quick eye saw on the Lucrine Lake the shelter for the fleets that were to be manned and trained before they could hope to face Sextus Pompeius, the bold corsair chief, who swept the seas and menaced Rome with famine. Thanks to him again, the victory of Actium was won, for the genius, if not the courage, of Octavianus failed him on the scene of battle. Whenever danger showed itself henceforth, in Gaul and Spain, where the native tribes rose once more in arms, in Pontus, where one of the line of Mithridates unfurled the banner of revolt, on the shores of the Danube, where the Pannonians were stirring. No hand but Agrippa's could be trusted to dispel the gathering storms. We find in him, not heroism alone, but the spirit of self-sacrifice. Three times, we read, he refused the honors of a triumph. At a word he stooped to the lowest round of official rank, the aedileship, burdened as it was with the ruinous responsibilities of shows and festivals, and kept the Romans in good humor at a critical moment of the civil struggle. To win further popularity by the sweets of material well-being, the soldier forsook the camp and courted the arts of peace, busied himself with sanitary reforms, repaired the magnificent cloacae of old Rome, constructed the splendid termae for the hot baths introduced from eastern lands, built new aqueducts, towering aloft upon the arches of the old, and distributed the pure water so conveyed to fountains in every quarter of the city, which were decorated with statues and columns of precious marbles to be counted by the hundred. Another sacrifice was called for, to divorce the daughter of Atticus, Cicero's famous friend, and draw nearer the throne by marrying the emperor's niece Marcella, and he obeyed from dutiful submission to his master, or from the ambitious hope to share the power which his sword had won. Soon it seemed as if his loyalty was to meet with its reward. Augustus was brought to death's door by sudden illness, and in what seemed like his last hour seized Agrippa's hand and slipped a ring upon the finger, as if to mark him out for his successor. But health returned again, and with it visible coolness toward Agrippa, and increased affection for Marcellus, his young nephew. Agrippa resigned himself without a murmur, and lived in retirement a while at Lesbos, till the death of Marcellus and the warnings of Mycenas pointed him out again as the only successor worthy of the empire. Signs of discontent among the populace of Rome quickened the emperor's desire to have his trusty friend beside him, and to draw him yet more closely to him, he bade him put away Marcella, and gave him his own daughter Julia. Once more he obeyed in silence, and now might fairly hope to be rewarded for his patience, and one day to mount into the weakly emperor's place. But his lot was to be always second, never first. 
his strong frame slowly weakened by hard campaigns and ceaseless journeys at full speed in every quarter of the world gave way at last in twelve b c and his career was closed while he seemed yet in his prime in him augustus lost a gallant soldier and unselfish friend who is said indeed to have advised him after actium to resign his power but who certainly had done more than any other to set him up and to keep him on the pinnacle of greatness it throws a curious light upon his story to read the comment on it in the pages of the naturalist pliny he is speaking of the superstitious fancy that misery clouded the lives of all who were called agrippa in spite he says of his brilliant exploits he was no exception to the rule he was unlucky in his wife julia who dishonoured his good name in his children who died by poison or in exile and unhappy also in bearing all his life what he calls the hard bondage of augustus the friend for whom he toiled so long and faithfully showed little tenderness of heart the master whom he served had tasked his energies in every sphere and called for many an act of self-devotion but he had already looked coldly on his loyal minister and he might at any moment weary of a debt he could not pay and add another page to the long chronicle of the ingratitude of princes Mycenas, better known by his mother's name than that of kilnius his father came from an etruscan stock that had given a line of masters to Aretium. He was better fitted for the council chamber than the field of battle, for the delicate manoeuvres of diplomacy than for the rough work of stormy times. During the years of civic struggle, and while the air was charged with thunderclouds, we find him always as the trusty agent of Octavianus engaged on every important mission that needed adroitness and address. His subtle tact and courtesies were tried with the same success upon sextus pompeius and on antonius when the confidence of each was to be won or angry feelings charmed away or the dangers of a coalition met his honeyed words were found of not less avail with the populace of rome when scarcity and danger threatened and the masters of the legions were away it seemed indeed after the empire was once established that his political career was closed for he professed no high ambition refused to wear the gilded chains of office or to rise above the modest rank of knighthood he seemed content with his great wealth how gained we need not ask with the social charms of literary circles and the refinements of luxurious ease of which the etruscans were proverbially fond but his influence though secret was as potent as before he was still the emperor's chief adviser counselling tact and moderation ready to soothe his ruffled nerves when sick and weary with the cares of state he was still serving on a secret mission and one that lasted all his life keenly relishing the sweets of peace and all the refined and social pleasures which a great capital alone can furnish haunted by no high principles to vex his sybaritic ease and gifted with a rare facility of winning words he was peculiarly fitted to influence the tone of roman circles and diffuse a grateful pride in the material blessings of imperial rule he could sympathize with the weariness of men who had passed through long years of civic strife and seen every cause betrayed by turns and who craved only peace and quiet with leisure to enjoy and to forget instinct or policy soon led him to caress the rising poets of the day for their social influence might be great their epigrams soon passed from mouth to mouth a well-turned phrase or a bold satire lingered in the memory long after the sound of the verses died away and the practice of public recitations gave them at times something of the power to catch the public ear which journalism has had in later days so from taste and policy alike mycenas played the part of patron of the arts and letters he used the fine point and wit of horace to sing the praises of the enlightened ruler who gave peace and plenty to the world to scoff meantime at high ambitions and play with the memory of fallen causes the social philosophy of moderation soothed the self-respect of men who were sated with the fierce game of politics and war and gladly saw their indolent and sceptical refinement reflected in the poet's graceful words 
he used the nobler muse of virgil to lead the fancy of the romans back to the good old days ere country life was deserted for the camp and city suggesting the subject of the georgics to revive the old taste for husbandry and lead men to break up the wasteland with the plough he helped also to degrade that muse by leading it astray from worthier themes to waste its melody and pathos in the uncongenial attempt to throw a halo of heroic legend round the cradle of the julian line other poets too propertius tibullus ovid paid dearly for the patronage which cramped their genius and befouled their taste and in place of truer inspiration prompted chiefly amorous insipidities and servile adulation for himself his chief aim in later life seemed careless ease but that boon fled away from him the more he wooed it the emperor eyed terentia his wife too fondly and the injured husband consoled himself with the best philosophy he could but she was a scold as well as a coquette and now drove him to despair with bitter words now lured him to her side again till their quarrels passed at length beyond the house and became the common talk of all the gossips of the town as he was borne along the streets lolling in his litter in a dress loose with studied negligence his fingers all bedecked with rings with eunuchs and parasites and jesters in his train men asked each other with a smile what was the last news of the fickle couple were they married or divorced again at last his nerves gave way and sleep forsook him in vain he had recourse to the pleasures of the table which his tuscan nature loved to the rare wines that might lull his cares to rest to distant orchestras of soothing music in earlier days he had set to tuneful verse what seneca calls the shameful prayer that his life might still be spared when health and strength and comeliness forsook him he lived long enough to feel the vanity of all his wishes nothing could cure his lingering agony of sleeplessness or drive the spectre of death from his bedside but the end came at last he passed away and loyal even in his death he left the emperor his heir we have watched augustus in his public life and marked his measures and his ministers it is time now to turn to his domestic circle and see what influences were about him there the chief figure to be studied is livia his wife who had been the object of his violent love while still married to tiberius nero and had been forced to quit her reluctant husband for the home of the triumvir she soon gained over him an influence that never wavered her gentle courtesies of manner her wifely virtues never tainted by the breath of scandal the homeliness with which she copied the grave matrons of old days who stayed at home and spun the wool to clothe their men the discreet reserve with which she shut her eyes to her husband's infidelities are the reasons given by herself as we are told when she was asked for the secret of her power quite insufficient in themselves they may have helped to secure the ascendancy which her beauty and her strength of character had won the gradual change that may be traced in the outward bearing of augustus may be due partly to her counsels certainly she seemed to press patience and forbearance on him and dion cassius at a later time puts into her mouth a pretty sermon on the grace of mercy when her husband's temper had been soured by traitorous plots she was open-handed too in works of charity brought up poor children at her own expense and gave many a maid a marriage dower caligula who knew her well and had insight in his own mad way called her ulysses in petticoats and the men of her own day it seems thought her such a subtle schemer that they credited her with acts of guile of which no evidence was produced dark rumours floated through the streets of rome and men spoke of her in meaning whispers as death knocked again and again at the old man's doors and the favourites of the people passed away it was her misfortune or her guilt that all who were nearest to the emperor all who stood between her son and the succession died by premature and seemingly mysterious deaths the young marcellus to whose memory virgil raised the monument of his pathetic lines the brave agrippa cut off when all his hopes seemed nearest to fulfilment 
two of Julia's children by Agrippa, within eighteen months of each other, all died in turn before their time, and all were followed to the grave by regrets and by suspicions that grew louder in each case. For Livia had no children by Augustus. Of the fruit of her first marriage, Drusus died in Germany, and Tiberius alone was left. The popular fancy, goaded by repeated losses, found it easy to believe that a ruthless tragedy was going on before their eyes, and that the chief actor was a mother scheming for her son, calmly sweeping from his path every rival that she feared. One grandson still was left, the youngest of Julia's children, Agrippa Postumus, who was born after his father's death. On him Augustus lavished his love a while as the last hope of his race, adopted him even as his own, but soon he found, or was led to fancy, that the boy was clownish and intractable, removed him to Sorrentum, and when confinement made him worse, to the island of Planasia. But one day pity or regret stole over the old man's heart. He slipped away quietly with a single confidant to see the boy seemed to feel the old love revive again, and spoke as if he would restore him to his place at home. The one bystander told his wife the story, and she whispered it to Livia's ear. That witness died, suddenly soon after, and his wife was heard to moan that her indiscretion caused his death. Then Livia dared no longer to wait, lest the dotard's fondness should be fatal to her hopes, Quietly she took her potent drugs to a favorite fig tree in a garden close at hand. Then, as they walked together, later on offered him the poisoned figs and ate herself of the harmless ones that grew beside. Such were the stories that were current at the time, too lightly credited perhaps from fear or hate, but noteworthy as reflecting the credulous suspicions of the people and the fatality that seemed to haunt the household of the Caesars. Of that family, the two Julias yet remained alive, the wife and daughter of Agrippa, but they were pining in their lonely prisons, and their memory had almost passed away. End of section 3。section 4 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes, this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 1. Augustus, B.C. 31 to A.D. 14, Part 3. The elder Julia was the child of Augustus by Scribonia, betrothed while still in the nursery to a young son of Antonius. She was promised in jest to Cotesan, a chieftain of the Getae, and then to the nephew of the emperor, Marcellus. At his death, she passed at the age of seventeen, and with her the hopes of the succession, to Agrippa's house, where an earlier wife was displaced to make room for her. Eleven years she lived with him, and when he died, Tiberius must in his turn divorce the Agrippina whom he loved, and take the widowed princess to his house. She had been brought up strictly, almost sternly by her father. Profligate as he had been himself in early life, his standard of womanly decorum was a high one, and he wished to see in Julia the austere dignity of the Roman matrons of the old days. But she was readier to follow the examples of his youth than the disguises and hypocrisies of his later life. She scorned the modest homeliness of Livia and the republican simplicity of Augustus, aired ostentatiously her pride of race, and loved profusion and display. Once freed by marriage from the restraints of her father's home, she began a career of license unparalleled even for that age. She flung to the winds all womanly reserves, paraded often in her speech a cynical disdain for conventional restraints, and gathered round her the most reckless of the youth of Rome, till her excesses became a scandal and a byword through the town. The emperor was the last to know of his dishonored name. He had marked indeed with grave displeasure her love of finery and sumptuous living, and had even destroyed a house which she built upon too grand a scale. 
but for years no one dared to tell him more till at last some one perhaps livia raised the veil and the whole story of her life was known he heard of her long career of guilty license and how but lately she had roved at night through the city with her train of revellers and made the forum the scene of her worst orgies dishonouring with bold words and shameless deeds the very tribune where her father stood but yesterday to speak in favour of his stricter marriage laws he was told though with little show of truth that she was plotting a still darker deed and urging her paramour to take his life the blow fell very hardly on the father and clouded all the peace of his last years at first his rage passed quite from his control her desks were ransacked her slaves were tortured and all the infamous details poured out before the senate when he was told that phoebe the freedwoman and confidant of julia had hung herself in her despair he answered grimly would that i were phoebe's father nothing but her death seemed likely to content him then came a change he shut himself away from sight and would speak of her no more she was exiled to a cheerless island to b c and though the fickle people in tiberius even pleaded for her pardon she was at most allowed at regium a less gloomy prison there in her despairing loneliness she must have felt a lingering agony of retribution she heard how the hand of vengeance fell upon her friends and paramours and harder still to bear how child after child mysteriously died and only two were left agrippa thrust away from sight and pity on his petty island and julia who had followed in her mother's steps and was an exile and a prisoner like herself such family losses and dishonours might well embitter the emperor's last years but other causes helped to deepen the gloom which fell upon him since agrippa's death there was no general whom he could trust to lead his armies no strong hand to curb the restless tribes of the half-conquered north or roll back from the frontiers the tide of war he sent his grandsons to the distant armies but they were young and inexperienced and firmer hands than theirs were needed to save the eagles from disgrace one great disaster at this time revealed the danger and sent a thrill of horror through the empire the german tribes upon the gallic border had kept unbroken peace of late and many of them seemed quite to have submitted to the roman rule a few years before indeed some hordes had dashed across the rhine upon a plundering foray and in the course of it had laid an ambush for the roman cavalry and driven them and lollius their leader backward in confusion and disgrace but that storm had rolled away again and the tribes sent hostages and begged for peace roman influence seemed spreading through the north as year by year the legions and the traders carried the arts of settled life into the heart of germany but in an evil hour quintilius verus was sent thither in command the rule seemed too lax and the change too slow for his impatience and he set himself to consolidate and civilize in hot haste discontent and disaffection spread apace but verus saw no danger and had no suspicions the german chieftains when their plots were laid plied him with fair assurances of peace lured him to leave the rhine and march toward the visurgis weser through tribes that were all ready for revolt wiser heads warned him of the coming danger but in vain he took no heed he would not even keep his troops together and in hand at last the schemers armenius hermann at their head thought the time had come they began the rising at a distance and made him think it only a local outbreak in a friendly country so they led him on through forest lands then rose upon him on all sides in a dangerous defile the legions taken by surprise as they were marching carelessly hampered with baggage and camp followers could make little head against their foes they tried to struggle on through swamps and woods where falling trees crushed them as they passed along and barricades were piled by unseen hands while wind and rain seemed leagued together for their ruin 
three days they stood at bay and strove to beat off their assailants who returned with fresh fury to the charge then their strength or courage failed them the more resolute spirits slew themselves with their own hands and the rest sank down to die nine a d of three full legions few survived and for many a year the name of that field of death the saltus teutoburgiensis sounded ominously in roman ears in the capital there was a panic for a while a short time before they had heard the tidings that pannonia was in revolt and now came the news that germany was all in arms and forcing the roman lines stripped as they were of their army of defence might pour into italy which seemed a possible nay easy prey the danger indeed was not so imminent tiberius and after him germanicus maintained the frontier and avenged their soldiers but the loss of prestige was very great and the emperor felt it till his death for months of mourning he would not trim his beard or cut his hair and varus give me back my legions was the moan men often heard him utter he felt it the more keenly because soldiers were so hard to find at the centre no one would enlist in vain he appealed to their sense of honour in vain he had recourse to stringent penalties he was forced at last to enrol freedmen and make up his legions from the rabble of the streets he had seen long since with alarm that the population was decreasing had restocked the dwindling country towns with colonists had tried to promote marriage among all classes had forced through a reluctant senate the lex papia popaia by which celibacy was saddled with penal disabilities but men noticed with a sneer that the two consuls after whom the law was named were both unmarried and it was a hopeless effort to arrest such social tendencies by legislation the central countries of the empire could not now find men to fill the ranks the veterans might be induced to forsake the little glebes of which they soon grew weary but others would not answer to the call whole regions were almost deserted and the scanty populations had little mind for war so the distant provinces became the legion's recruiting ground and the last comers in the empire must defend it under the pressure of such public and domestic cares we need not wonder that the emperor became moody and morose and that the unlovely qualities of earlier days began to reappear he shunned the gentle courtesies of social life would be present at no festive gathering disliked even to be noticed or saluted increasing weakness gave him an excuse for failing to be present in the senate a few picked men could represent the body and the emperor's bedchamber became a privy council he heard with petulance that the exiles in the islands were trying to relax the rigour of their lot and living in comfort and in luxury stringent restrictions were imposed upon their freedom he heard of writings that were passed through men's hands in which his name was spoken of with caustic wit and scant respect the books must be hunted out at once and burnt and the authors punished if they could be found the bitter partisanship with which titus labienus had expressed his republican sympathies and the meaning look with which he turned over pages of his history which could be read only after he was dead have made his name almost typical of the struggle between despotism and literary independence cassius severus said he must be burnt himself if the memory of labienus's work must be quite stamped out and his was accordingly the first of the long list of cases in which the old laws of treason the leges maestatis were strained to reach not acts alone but words a much more familiar name the poet ovid is brought before us at this time the spoiled child of the fashionable society of rome he had early lent his facile wit to amuse the careless worldlings round him had made a jest of the remonstrances of serious friends who tried to win his thoughts to politics and busy life and had squandered all his high gifts of poetry on frivolous or wanton themes his conversational powers or his literary fame attracted the notice of the younger julia and he was drawn into the gay circle that surrounded her there in an evil hour it seems 
he was made the confidant of dangerous secrets and was one of the earliest to suffer when the emperor's eyes at last were opened to the would-be censor and reformer of the public morals who had turned his back upon the follies of his youth the poet's writings must have long been distasteful as thinly veiled allurements to licentiousness the indignant grandfather eyed them still more sternly saw in them the source or the apology of wanton deeds and drove their author from the rome he loved so well in eight a d to a half-civilized home at tomi on the scythian frontier from which all his unmanly flatteries and lamentations failed to free him it was time augustus should be called away he had lived too long for happiness and fame his subjects were growing weary of their master and some were ready to conspire against him still doubtless in the provinces men blessed his name as they thought of the prosperity and peace which he had long secured to them one ship's crew of alexandria we read when he put into putioli where they were came with garlands frankincense and glad words of praise to do him honour to him they owed so ran their homage their lives their liberties and the well-being of their trade but those who knew him best were colder in their praises now and scarcely wished that he should tarry long among them for seventy-five years his strength held out sickly and enfeebled as his body seemed the summons came as he was coasting by campania and left him only time to crawl to naples and thence to nola where he died to those who stood beside his bed his last words if reported truly breathed the spirit of his life what think ye of the comedy my friends have i fairly played my part in it if so applaud the applause if any must be given to the actor rather than to the man for the least lovely features of his character seemed most truly his in his last years he was busy with the task of giving an account of his long stewardship long ago he had set on foot a survey of the empire and maps had been prepared by the geographical studies of agrippa valuations of landed property had been made as one step though a very partial one toward a uniform system of taxation he had now gathered up for the benefit of his successors and the senate all the varied information that lay ready to his hand he had written out with his own hand we are told the statistics of chief moment an account of the population in its various grades of privilege the muster rolls of all the armies and fleets and the balance sheet of the revenue and expenditure of state taught by the experience of later years or from the depression caused by decaying strength he added for future rulers the advice to be content with organizing what was won already and not to push the frontiers of the army further before he died he took a last survey of his own life wrote out a summary of all the public acts which he cared to recall to memory and left directions that the chronicle should be engraved on brazen tablets in the mausoleum built to do him honour the chronicle may still be read though not at rome in a distant province at the town of ancyra in galatia a temple had been built for the worship of augustus and the guardian priests had a copy of his own biography carved out at length in stone on one of the side walls the temple has passed since then to other uses and witnessed the rites of a different religion houses have sprung up round it and partly hidden though probably preserve the old inscription until of late only a part of it could be deciphered but a few years ago the patient energy of the explorers sent out by the french government succeeded in uncovering the whole wall and making a complete copy of nearly all that had been written on it from the place where it was found its literary name is the monumentum ancyranum it is not without a certain grandeur which even those may feel who dispute the author's claim to greatness with stately confidence and monumental brevity of detail it unfolds the long roll of his successes disdaining seemingly to stoop to the pettiness of bitter words it speaks calmly of his fallen rivals veiling indeed in constitutional terms the illegalities of his career but misleading or unfair only by its silence not a word is there to revive the hateful memory of the proscriptions little to indicate the dire suspense of the war with sextus pompeius 
or the straits and anxieties of the long struggle with Antonius. But those questionable times of his career once passed, the narrative flows calmly on. It recounts with proud self-confidence the long list of battles fought and victories won, the nations finally subdued under his rule, the eastern potentates who sought his friendship, the vassal princes who courted his protection. It tells of the many colonies which he had founded, and of the towns recruited by his veterans, speaks of the vast sums that he had spent on shows and largesse for the people, and describes the aqueducts and various buildings that had sprung up at his bidding to add to the material magnificence of Rome. For all these benefits the grateful citizens had hailed him as the father of his country. To the provincials who read these lines it might seem perhaps that there were few signs in them of any feeling that the empire owed any duties to themselves. A few words of reference to the sums spent in time of need upon their towns, and that was all. To the administrator, it might seem a strange omission to say nothing of the great change in the ruling mechanism. Yet in what was there omitted lay his claim to greatness. The plea which justified the empire was found in the newly organized machinery of government and in the peace and justice long secured to the whole civilized world. High as he had risen in life, he was to be raised to a yet higher rank after his death, and the deified Augustus became, like many a succeeding emperor, the object of a national worship. A phenomenon so startling to our modern thought calls for some words of comment. First, we may note that polytheism naturally tends to efface the boundary lines between the human and the divine. It peoples earth and air and water with its phantom beings of bounded powers and clashing wills and weaves with wanton hand the fanciful tissue of its legends, in which it plays with the story of their loves and hates and fitful moods of passion, till its deities can scarcely be distinguished from the mortal men and women in whose likeness they are pictured. Eastern thought, moreover, seldom scrupled to honour its great men with the names and qualities of Godhead. Often in servile flattery, sometimes perhaps in the spirit of a mystic creed, it saw in the rulers who it feared a sort of avatar or incarnation of a power divine which it made the object of its worship the pharaohs of egypt and the monarchs of assyria were deified even in their lifetime by the language of inscriptions and in later times temples were raised in asia minor in honour of the governors of the day so that antonius and cleopatra gave little shock to eastern sentiment when in their royal pageant they assumed the titles and symbols of Isis and Osiris. It was therefore on this side of the Roman world that the fashion of worshipping the emperor began. Even in the lifetime of Augustus, deputations came from the towns of Asia, which were anxious to set up altars and build temples in his honour. For a while, indeed, he treated them with coldness and sometimes with mockery. He yet could not quite repress the enthusiasm of their servile worship, which grew apace in the more distant provinces. Less credulous minds looked upon the tendency as only a fanciful way of symbolizing a great fact. Much of the simple faith in the old legendary creeds had passed away before the critical spirit of Greek culture, and many thought that the heroes and gods of the old fables were but the great men of past times seen through the mist of popular fancy till a divine halo gathered round their superhuman stature. If the sentiment of bygone days had made gods out of the men who sowed the seeds of art and learning, and tamed the savagery of early life, the wondering awe of ignorant folk might be allowed to crystallize still in the same forms, and to find a national deity in the great ruler who secured for the whole world the boon of civilized order. So reasoned probably the critical and unimpassioned content to humour the credulous fancy of the masses, and to deal tenderly with an admiration which they did not share, but which it might be dangerous to thwart. Above all in Italy, the tendency in question found support and strength in a widespread feeling which had lingered on from early times, that the souls of men did not pass away at death, but still haunted their old homes, and watched as guardian lares over the weal and woe of the generations that came after offering and prayer seemed but a fitting token of respect, and might be useful to quicken their sympathies or appease their envy. 
thus every natural unity the family the clan the canton and the nation had their tutelary powers and special ritual of genuine home growth while in nearly all besides the foreign influences had overlaid the old religious forms it had been part of the conservative policy of augustus to foster these old forms of worship to repair the little chapels in the city wards and to give priestly functions to the masters of the streets officially connected with them even while he lived he allowed the figure of his genius to be placed in the chapels beside the lares at his death divine honours were assigned to it as to the rest or rather it rose above them all as the imperial unity had towered above the petty districts which they were thought to guard temples rose to the deified augustus altars smoked in every land and guilds of augustales were organized to do him priestly service for the provinces were eager to follow the example of the imperial city and their loyal zeal had even outstripped the reverence of rome the ruling powers were well pleased to see a halo of awfulness gather round their race while subject peoples saw in the apotheosis of the monarch only a fitting climax to the majesty of his life and a symbol of the greatness of the empire and so succeeding monarchs in their turn were deified by pagan rome as saints were canonized by favour of the pope the senate's vote gave divine honours with the title of deus and it was passed commonly as a matter of course or withheld only as a token of abhorrence or contempt End of section four.